Hey guys, welcome back. <clears throat> I uh, have a couple of different ways I'd like to talk about your power supply project coming up next week. Um, one is to simulate in ORCAD. So you can see I've got uh, <clears throat> a sinusoidal source here that's supposed to represent the wall power. I've got a, a transformer that's going to take the voltage down by 10 and the current up by a factor of 10. Then I've got a bridge, a capacitor, and a load. So this is very simple. Um, and if I run this guy, let's see, uh, here we go. There you have it. So let's go back and look for a second at where we had the probes. I had one probe <clears throat> at one end of the transformer coil. I had the other probe at the other <laughs> end of the transformer coil. And you'll notice that at different parts of the cycle, that probe is either going to be a voltage above the high voltage on the capacitor or some voltage um, below ground. So ground is at the anode of these two diodes, and <clears throat> the top of the capacitor is at the cathode of these two diodes. And then depending on the phase of the transformer, the diode is either going to be blocking or conducting uh, on any given cycle. Then the other probe, the green probe here, is at the high voltage side of the capacitor and the load. Okay, so let's go back here and look at this. <clears throat> so the green is the voltage on the capacitor. And you can see that when the blue phase goes above the voltage on the capacitor, the capacitor starts to charge up. But it... It doesn't happen right away. It has to get a diode drop above the capacitor voltage before the capacitor charges, and it only charges up to one diode drop below that maximum voltage. And then from then on, once it goes below a diode drop above the maximum voltage, the uh, diode is no longer conducting, and the capacitor is simply discharging through the load. And then that continues until the other phase gets a diode drop above the capacitor. Then that guy charges up, and so on. <clears throat> okay, um, I went ahead and exported this data, which I'll show you here in a minute, um, and included the current. So the other question is how much current is flowing through the capacitor. Notice when the voltage on the capacitor is going up, there's a current flowing into the capacitor. When the voltage on the capacitor is dropping, there's a current flowing out. But the slope of the, of the discharge is much, much more gradual than the slope of the charge. And so the current coming in, it inrushes, it fills that capacitor with charge very in a very short period of time. Um, it looks like, you know, maybe a millisecond or something. These are milliseconds here, I think. Yep. So in, on the order of a millisecond, the capacitor charges, and then it takes eight milliseconds for it to discharge until the next inrush of current. So you know that the current in the inrush has to be eight times bigger than the current being delivered to the load. Um, but it only comes, you know, once every eight milliseconds, something like that. <clears throat> so there you go. Let's, uh, let's look at this other tab. So in this other tab, I have the same circuit in every circuit. Now you remember every circuit is not as sophisticated as, say, ORCAD or LT Spice even. But the one thing it does have going for it is it, it produces a nice visual representation of what's going on. So, uh, and you can really see here how the current only flows. This, the green is the current here. It's only flowing at, for that short period of time when the uh, capacitor is getting charged. So the capacitor is discharging, charging, discharging, charging. Now, for some reason, in every circuit, the, the uh, sinusoidal voltage from the transistor or the transformer is not as pretty. I'm not sure what's going on there, but this is sort of, you could think of this as like the beating heart of your power supply, right? It's that periodic spurt of current that's recharging that capacitor. <clears throat> you can see that it gets charged and then it's slowly discharging, then quickly charged, slowly discharging, and so on. So that's the way that works. Okay, another thing I want to point out here is that the regulation is not exactly fantastic. You can see that the the voltage on the capacitor is is jumping up and down um, by about three quarters of a volt, you know, between the charge and the discharge. Um, 
and the current being delivered to the load, let's actually take a look at that. If I, if I watch the current uh, in the load, that's around 13 milliamps. So we're not getting a lot of current, and it's not coming very regularly because the voltage is going up and down so much. <clears throat> so the 13 milliamps is basically just the average of the charge being delivered by the by the diodes here. Remember, it's going up. Um, let's see. It looks like it goes up to about 50 milliamps in the pulse, and then it uh, goes down to minus whatever that is, <clears throat> um, minus 12 or 13 milliamps between the spurts of charge that charge up the capacitor. But the uh, the voltage output is is varying between 12.6 um, and 13.4 volts. So what can we do about that? So one thing we could do is to increase the capacitance of the capacitor. Of course, that's going to um, increase the amount of charge stored on the capacitor, but it's also going to mean that the current spurts are going to be shorter. So let's let's try that. Let's say if we go from 100 microfarads, now the simulator is probably going to go nuts here. I'll take it up to a 1,000 microfarads. So that's... Um, <clears throat> a millifarad, <laughs> in other words. And let's see what happens to that that ripple. Okay. So it's going to get its head screwed on here. Now instead of um, 12 milliamps, we're going to be asking for something more like... Uh, well, I'm sorry. We've got the same load, so we're... Uh, we're getting the same average current that we had before, but this time, uh, what is the ripple going to be? Aha, now we're down to a tenth of a volt, okay? 900, 800, or 90 or 80 or 90 millivolts. So we'd reduced our ripple by um, a factor of seven or eight. Is that right? Or actually a factor of 10. So we Increased our capacitance by a factor of 10. We got our ripple down by a factor of 10. It's 73 millivolts now. Okay. The average current is about the same. Um, if we had a better simulator, I think you'd see that the pulses of current would now uh, be shorter and potentially higher. But uh, we should try it on ORCAD when we get back in the lab. The uh, the thing is, now the current is relatively steady. But what happens if I decide I need to reduce the load a little bit here, reduce the load resistance, increase the load current? I, I want more than 12 milliamps. Perhaps I want to go to, um, I don't know, 300 ohms, something like that. How is that going to affect things? <clears throat> so now I'm drawing more current. My current draw... Let's see. It's up to 40 milliamps now. And the burst current is now 100 milliamps. Okay. And what about my voltage variation? Now I'm two tenths of a volt, 200 millivolts. Let's take that up a little bit more. What if I go to 100 ohms? Now I've got one and a half volts variation. Let's see, let's let those peaks die out a little bit. Okay. Okay, half a volt variation. Even with the 1,000 microfarad capacitor, I'm back up to a half a volt, but I've got 100 milliamps of current. So what can I do? I mean, there's a limit to what I can do. A 1,000 microfarad capacitor is a pretty fairly healthy capacitor. It's a, you know, it's a big thing. So um, what can I do that wouldn't just involve adding more capacitance to the thing? Um, but I want to stick with this. I want to have a fairly healthy current draw, like uh, 100 milliamps or something like that. Well, one thing I can do is add uh, a Zener diode. So let's look at that. I'll go ahead and put in a Zener. That'll give me uh, some current regulation, but it has another problem. We'll see here in a second. <clears throat> so 
so I've got 10 volts here. If I want um, 5 milliamps for the Zener, that means, uh, well, I'm going to have a problem here, Arnie. Let's, let's say, let's, uh, let's switch my load. Okay, what I'm going to do Okay. So let's make this a 7 volt zener say. So I'm going to dial it down to 7 volt. So that'll cut down on the regulated current. I'm going to make a larger resistive load, larger resistance, just to talk about the problem here. Okay, so let's make it 10K. And then uh, I'll connect that to the 7 volt zener. So we'll be expecting what? Um, less than a milliamp. So maybe 7 tenths of a milliamp here, something like that. And then <coughs> here I've got. 12 volts, right? 7 volts, so that's going to be 5. I want 5 milliamps, so 1K, that'll be about right. Let's go ahead and run that. <clears throat> Let's watch the current through the Zener. Okay, 4 milliamps, 4.6, something like that. That's, that's sort of what I was expecting. Um, how much current are we getting on the load? So uh, 700 microamps, 0.7 milliamps, right? That's sort of what we were expecting. So that's working. The uh, What's the output of the Zener? It's about seven volts. So that's, everything's working as expected. The problem is, and I'm, and I'm getting, uh, let's see, what kind of current am I getting through the Zener? That's a good question. About five milliamps. So that's about what we expected, okay. But the problem is if I start, if I try to start drawing more current, so I want to get up to 100 milliamps, which is what I had before, I'm going to have to dial down this resistance. And as I dial down that resistance, that's going to increase the current. But look what happens to the current through the Zener then. I'm stealing current from the Zener to deliver to the load. And when I do that, uh, it, it'll reach a point where it can't regulate anymore. Of course, I could reduce this uh, resistor here that limits the current through the Zener and the load, but then the I'm still going to be directly sharing current between the load and the Zener. I want the Zener current to be 5 milliamps. If I'm going to take the load up to 100 milliamps, it's going to be very hairy trying to keep that Zener fed when small fluctuations in the load are going to cause the current through the Zener to vary a lot. So um, it's really not a sensible plan. So what I have to do, let's see, how am I doing? <clears throat> if I, uh, let's go ahead and drop this a little bit more and I'll show you where the problem happens. I'm gonna drop this resistance. How am I doing? I've got two milliamps now through the uh, load. I've still got about three or four milliamps through the Zener. Let's bring it down some more. Okay. Bring it down some more. Uh-oh, now I'm in trouble. So now you'll notice that the Zener current is now fluctuating, let's see. If I turn off the load, let's hide the load current for a while. And just look at and turn off the capacitor current for a while. So now you'll see the, the Zener current is basically zero, right? I'm in the nanoamps region. So what's the load current? I'm in at six milliamps. I've taken all the current from the Zener. So now I've got, I'm in a game here, or I've got a 
I'm going to have to dial down this resistance to get the Zener current back up. Okay, now I'm I'm good, but it's not great because I'm I really want to be up in the five to ten milliamp range in the Zener. Um, so I'm it's a delicate balance between the load and the Zener. So this is not a great way to use the Zener diode to produce a regulated voltage. Um, what I want to do is to add an emitter follower. So let's do that. <clears throat> so now I've got the, this guy is now uh, setting the Zener current, and this guy's using that current, that voltage of the Zener to set the output voltage. Maybe we could, in order to compensate for the diode drop, I could go ahead and replace this with the 7.6 seven volt zener and then my output voltage should still be the same i just got a slightly different zener to accommodate for that diode drop in the emitter follower now how am i doing <clears throat> i'll watch that output voltage okay so now, because the, um, the Zener current is still changing a little bit, but it's only varying between 5.4 and 5.8 milliamps. It's not going to zero or anything close to that. But the output voltage is now pretty darn stable. I'm, I'm down to 3 millivolts of variation, whereas before we were in the 10s and 20s. And how much load current am I getting? I'm at 67 milliamps. So you can see that... The Zener current is stable. The output voltage is relatively stable. And I'm drawing um, 60 milliamps. I could then, uh, I could go ahead and reduce this resistance, get me down to 60 ohms. And now I should be close to 100 milliamps. And still, my Zener current, it's varying a little bit, but it's not too bad. Let's see what happens when it settles down. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm below a milliamp, right? And then what about the voltage variation on the output? Six millivolts, okay? So that's not too bad for a 100 milliamp supply. Now, sometimes we want a 500 milliamp supply or a one amp supply. We're gonna run into problems with this circuit with that and we'll need to have some other, some other ideas. So we'll look at that next time. Hey guys, I wanted to show you how uh, I took the data from ORCAD, pulled it into Python, and uh, graphed it. So basically, it's nice to be able to analyze the data in different ways. In particular, one nice thing you can do once you get it in a CSV file is you can rescale the axes because ORCAD isn't super convenient that way. Um, <clears throat> so here I grab the voltage across the resistor and then the voltage across those two diodes. And I also exported the current through the capacitor. And you can see here, it's easy to pull those guys in and just look at the raw data. You can even say, hey, I wanna look at the data where time is less than 0.32 and graph that. I wanna put in some labels on the graph. I want to um, add a legend, right, for each of those graphs. And I can even graph current put the current scale on one side of the graph and put the voltage scale on the other side of the graph and graph current and voltage at the same time. So here you can see the voltage on the diodes uh, at the end of the bridge, the positive end of the bridge, uh, the current delivered to the resistor, 
of the voltage across the resistor, sorry, and here's the current delivered to the capacitor. So um, all that you can put in one graph. So I just wanted to show you how you do that. I'll also make some graphs in MATLAB, although I'm not as experienced with that. I'll figure it out. We can all figure it out together. Um, so you know how to do this in MATLAB as well. All right, very good. We'll talk to you guys soon.